Minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. A very good morning to you, sir. And I would also like to welcome our other esteemed panelists, CEO of the Citizenship by Investment Unit, Mr. Des Khan, and Ms. Natasha Jones, who is the Legal Assistant for Government Advisory Practice for CS Global Partners. Now, as we all know, immigrant investor programs have long been uh, long seen as a tool to offer an opportunity to deserving people from across the globe to settle in a country which otherwise would, wouldn't be possible. Now, the program also helps countries to become a more globalized economy with and attract the private investors from all parts of the world looking for a better standard of living and a safer environment. Now, with COVID-19 bringing the world to a standstill, private investors the world over are realigning their life goals and strategies and focusing more on a better, safe, and prosperous future for their families. Now, taking this conversation forward, Khalees Times is proud to host a webinar along with the presence of uh, uh, Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris, the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, and talk to him about what the current world crisis means for the immigration investment programs offered by countries after this is all over. Now, the webinar will not only have Dr. The Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Timothy Harris, share his thought on the world economy and the programs, but will also discuss on what makes an investor program successful. Now, with that, we would like to start the webinar now. And uh, first, we would like to begin with the interview of uh, uh, the Prime Minister. And I would like to invite our senior editor, Mr. Alan Jacob, uh, who is a senior editorial member of the Thalese Times and has interviewed many, of, many world leaders across his career to take over for the inaugural interview uh, with the Prime Minister. Alan, over to you. Thank you, Abhinav. Uh, good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, good morning. How are you doing? I am fine. Perhaps I uh, just say good afternoon. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, Prime Minister, I'd, 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 um, um, I'll, I'll get straight to the questions. I, I was very interested to, to learn that you have one of the oldest uh, CBI programs in the world. Uh, it, it began in the 80s. Could you explain to us how it has helped in the socioeconomic development? of the country. Thank you very much. Way back in 1984, St. Kitts and Nevis legislated for the first citizenship by investment program in the region. Putting that in context, in 1983, we became an independent nation. And therefore, we had to face all the challenges of development, basically, using our own ingenuity, industry, and resources. Developing a small state is never easy because you start with the restriction and size, mm -hmm. size of population, physical geography, all those things constrain the level and pace of development. So when we engineered the Citizenship by Investment Program, it was intended to create an alternative pathway for growth and development. It was intended to take advantage, multiply the opportunities within country to allow us to continue the pathway of growth and the development. This, of course, has become critically Im important. And so the CBI program was intended to give us the alternative to bring capital into the country to assist with the development given our own natural limits, to add, if you will, to our population of citizens so that they could help catalyze the growth and ongoing development of St. Kitts and Nevis with their various skills, with their resources, with their own interests in a safe and secure democracy. So by and large, I would say that was the genesis of the program. How has it worked? I would say in the last perhaps 10 years, we have finally realized the dream of the forefathers of this program. Our program was the first. It is the longest serving program. And we say it's a platinum program. It is still the best. We have developed a vast array of citizens across the globe, in the Middle East, the Gulf States, certainly in Africa, 
certainly in the USA and Canada and Europe. So everywhere, citizens have found this program to be the preferred program. It has added to jobs. It has created investment in our tourism plant. It has assisted with the social development of the country. So I would say we have realized dividends from our um, participation in such a program. And we do not contemplate going forward in the immediate future without the benefits of this program. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, in fact, when, you, when I was reading about it, I mean, it's, it, in, in the 80s, it was very futuristic, but it's come a long way and it's been very successful. On the, what are the, uh, what are the uh, current projects that you have, you are investing with funds from the program now? Well, we have several programs across public and private sector that are taking place at this point. In the public sector, we could point, for example, to the build out of a second coup spare. Tourism mm -hmm. is still what the main economic driver in the country, contributes significantly to direct employment for thousands of people within the country. And our coup's tourism product has grown tremendously. It has been the fastest growing coup's industry within the region. And over the last couple of years, we have received in excess of 1 million cruise passengers. There is therefore was a demand to create a better environment in which the cruise traffic can flow. We needed resources to help build out then a second cruise pair that would accommodate some of the largest and the best cruise ship. St. Kitts and Nevis perhaps stand alone in that we have the capacity to accommodate at least three of the largest cruise ship docking alongside our cruise pier with the addition of this second cruise pier, which is financed in part by the CBI program. We have, if we were to look at sports development, and sports development is critical to us within the region. We are, have invested, for example, in the international athletic tracks in the sister island of Nevis. We have invested in health services, and expanded the delivery of healthcare in the sister island of Nevis and certainly on St. Kitts too. So we have a wide array of things that are happening. We have been able to support training programs to prepare thousands of our people for real work opportunities when they would arise. So the investments have been significant. They have touched across private sector and public sector private sector entities such as the Ocean Terence Inn um, Hotel here in St. Kitts that had re support, received support from the Citizenship by Investment Program. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, how do you ensure the right people are granted citizenship? What is the vetting process like in the U UAE and, and globally? And how long does it take? Well, the, the vetting process is critical, and we have ensured by and large to maintain the platinum brand that we have taken all reasonable precautions to ensure that only the most um, vetted person, only the most discerning of a citizen is attracted to St. Kitts and Nevis. In that we want people who are honest, people of high integrity, people who could contribute to the development of St. Kitts and Nevis and minimize any reputational damage to our country. As a result, we have a multi-tiered system of due diligence, starting from the very beginning. Those who are going to bring them to the program must in fact know their customers and they go through their own diligence tests. We have training that prepared the service providers and island to do some form of due diligence in the citizenship by investment unit. Another layer of extensive due diligence is undertaken, taking advantage of our access to significant databases. From there again, we engage professional due diligence providers, some of the best anywhere in the world to do both online and on ground. Um, due diligence activities with respect to these applicants. 
And then at the upper level again, we go to a more detailed analysis by subjecting all applicants to the processes of Interpol and other international agencies engaged in crime fighting. That is, of course, to ensure that none of our applicants could be found guilty of, say, money laundering, counterfinancing, uh, sorry, financing of terrorism, and all those um, processes then are assisted to external independent body. So when, in fact, someone is accepted by our program, it means that that person would have gone through a strict, vigorous, sophisticated system of due diligence and vetting, not only within, but also by external party and have come with no derogatory complaints regarding that person. That is when the officials in the unit would approve. If perchance there are queries, there are derogatory information, more likely than not, that person will not be able to proceed further. Okay. Thank you, Prime Minister. Do economic citizens have the same rights as those born in, 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 in St. Kitts and Nevis? Economic citizens are part of our citizenry. And in St. Kitts and Nevis, the constitution by and large does not discriminate among the citizens. Okay. So all of our citizens are entitled to the same rights, um, whether born here to marriage, to residence, they then become oh. citizens and the constitution only define um, a citizen in, in, in terms of the rights and the obligations um, in the same way. Okay, thank you. I understand uh, St. Kitts uh, is a great destination for families. In your assessment, do you see more families moving there to settle down uh, over the years? What has been your assessment so far? You, you think more families are moving to, to, to St. Kitts and Nevis? Definitely St. Kitts is one of the most attractive places for people to come, to live, to work, to raise their families. And we have seen over time significant growth in the resident population in St. Kitts and Nevis, coming from a variety of channels. Some of them, of course, are our own quote-unquote economic citizens who have visited, fallen in love with the absolute beauty and charm of our country. Some of them, of course, are students who would have come here to study. We have about five international universities, universities catering and providing education for students from all over the world, including the United States of America, Africa, the Middle East, and so on. India. And so they come, they too fall in love because it is indeed a beautiful and majestic country and they can find what they need to do. And they're able to do that in a country which is very peaceful, almost always in a mode of tranquility and where they can go about in a free way because safety and security are critical attributes of the St. Kitts and Nevis my government is building. Also, I think people like the fact that we are a democratic country. We have just gone to during the force of a pandemic, a general elections monitored by external observers who declared it to be free and fair and free from fear. So there are lots of attributes beyond the scenery, the, the the fiscal beauty, physical beauty of the country, the people relationship, the ease with which people communicate with one another, all of these things, I think, make think it's a natural place where families would want to come. And we have seen, for example, some of the original investors from India and elsewhere set up their own schools here that allow people to come, their families to come, and all can be in the same physical space. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, St. Kitts and U.S. is, is in, in, in the eye of the hurricanes for most uh, part of the year. You, it, it is a challenge, but how do you balance your development agenda with sustainable living? Climate change is, is real. Uh, what is your vision for the environment in St. Kitts and U.S. and the Caribbean as a whole? 
Well, generally, we no longer see a, a conflict between development and the environment. Indeed, if the environment is not preserved, especially in a small country like ours, we understand there'll be no development. If we will destroy our coastal reefs, etc., then we have lost a significant part of our fisheries resources, which have become critical to our own development. We have long been engaged in protecting our forests. We have long been engaged in activities of sustainable development by virtue of the fact that we were small, with limited resources, we had to have the patience and the knowledge to attempt to preserve them for as long as possible. And so for us, sustainable development is critical. Without it, the country will not advance and we are taking initiatives that would help us develop a resilient people and an environment which is sustainable. Indeed, we have created, and maybe we are one of the few countries who have been created an entire ministry, dubbed the Ministry of Sustainable Development, that is looking at a number of initiatives, for example, in energy. How do we develop our solar systems? How do we use geothermal energy and add value to a sustainable form of energy? Affordable, it must be, that assists in the forward development and trajectory of St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, a political question I would, I would, as PM, you've headed a, a unity government, a coalition government for five years. What is your leadership philosophy? What is your vision as a leader? Uh, what drives you? Uh, you appear to be a consensus builder in a, in a time of great distress all over the world. What, what is that? What is that leadership vision that you would like to send out to the world? I think by and large, the consensus comes by the nature and the understanding that as a small country, we need all the resources and to the extent possible, unity and true unity, we will achieve more. And so with limited number of citizens resident in the country, we have to give them that encouragement as a government that they are part of the decision-making process that they have a role to play in constructing a St. Kitts and Nevis, which we want to be a model of the best managed uh, Milan states. And in that regard, you see that reflected in the type of government that I lead, a coalition government of three parties drawn from the two islands. Coalition government by nature require consensus leadership if you are to hold it together. And the experiences of coalition, whether in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, wherever they are, has been that coalition's government are difficult to survive. We have been fortunate that in St. Kitts and Nevis, we have shown that we could. For the last five years, we and I led a coalition government and there was not one public display significantly that led to any cracks, any perception that the government was going to fall. So we are going to bill on that in the second term. The second term, our theme throughout the election was that we want a stronger and safer St. Kitts and Nevis. That will require us to acknowledge the talent and the gifts of every citizen and resident and to provide a place for those to participate. Our view is that St. Kitts and Nevis must lead. We must lead as a nation. We must lead by our example in terms of our own initiatives, ingenuity that we bring forward to advance the people. My motivation comes from seeing our citizens and residents happy, happy with the job that the government is doing, happy about the fact that they can see that the country at large is being transforming in ways that may bring some level of satisfaction to them. Both at the individual level and collectively, people appreciate that we are the government trying hard. We are not yet there, but we are working towards it, trying hard to ensure that we have an all of society approach to nation building and development. So they too 
have a voice in the context of the democracy that we are building out. And we are looking at this, not just today, but for the future. I'll get to a question on the, on the tourism industry in light of the COVID crisis. How have you been able to, what are your thoughts on assisting the sector after the COVID crisis? What are your plans for the tourism sector in St. Kitts and Nevis? Okay. And so we have been working with the stakeholders in St. Kitts and Nevis and beyond to ensure that the hotels are ready, that the necessary protocols are being developed. Our health experts have been working very well with the hotel operators and their managers, with our international airport staff and the other agencies, the taxi operators, all to ensure that when we declare our international airport fully open, we can receive guests and we could do so in a manner that shows that we fully understand the challenges of COVID-19 and we could give reasonable assurance to our guests and to the workers in our hotel facilities that they would be relatively safe from harm. Your original uh, citizenship program was the Sugar Industry Diversification Foundation. But since 2018, you have the Sustainable Growth Fund, which is known to be the fastest and most secure way to gain citizenship. Why is this the fastest and most secure route? I mean, what, what has changed from the Sugar Industry Diversification Foundation to the Sustainable Growth Fund? I have my CEO, Les Ganhian. He deals with the more operational okay. details, so I'll ask him to respond to that. Hello, good Mr. Good afternoon. Yeah. Hello, how are you? Good, good, sir, how are you? Thank you. My pleasure. Um, the, the difference between the Sugar Industry Fund and the Sustainable Growth Fund um, primarily is price. Um, at the time that the SIGF uh, was in place, it, it was highly, highly priced and, and competitive in its market in that day. Since that time, obviously, there has been uh, many programs with varying costs associated with it. We have ensured that the St. Kitts and Nevis' program has maintained the platinum brand as, as we felt that it was necessary to maintain that high standard. And although there are programs that are much lower priced than St. Kitts and Nevis, um, we maintained the 150,000 for a single applicant, uh, much higher than everyone else. And this allows us to ensure that uh, people recognize us as the, the best in brand, the best in option. Um, the Sustainable Growth Fund is known to be the fastest uh, way to citizenship, mainly because it's, it's a simpler application process. Um, it does not entail purchase and sale agreements. It does not in, entail escrow. It does not entail funds being placed in escrow. It's a, it's a more direct route to investment. And this makes it a, a viable and more viable solution in, in this uh, marketplace. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Prime Minister. That's it from me. Uh, thank you for, it's been, it's been a delight talking to you. Uh, I leave the floor to Abhinav. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alan, and uh, thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, for your presence today. It's been a pleasure. I think we are going to continue our conversation. It's great to have Mr. Les Khan in the same room. So. Uh, we don't have to switch on this video. Uh, welcome, Mr. Les Khan, to the webinar, and uh, good morning to you over there. Uh, welcome back, Natasha. Thank uh, you. I think, uh, so the entire discussion is going to revolve around strength and recovery, as I mentioned, through citizenship by investment program. And um, my first question is for Mr. Les Khan. Uh, Mr. Khan, what processes have determined the success of the citizenship by investment unit of St. Kitts St. Kitts and Nevis was the first program, uh, first country to implement an automated solution, an end-to-end -end solution that operates 24 by seven. This allows um, the, the, the unit to operate in a most efficient manner. Over the years, we have modified our process. We have ensured that every step of the way is documented, that every step of the way is recorded. And this allows us to um, be most efficient in, in processing. 
this um, workflow analysis and workflow system also allows us to be the only country in the Caribbean and probably in the world to offer an accelerated application process. And it entails um, strong due diligence, the same due diligence that is required in any application, but because of our relationship with our due diligence providers and our ability to look at the workflow, we have been able to guarantee um, turnaround times within 60 days. So this allows us to uh, continue to be the most efficient unit in the, in the world. Now, I should emphasize that the, the unit's efficiency does not compromise <coughs> due diligence. And as the Prime Minister mentioned, there is a multi-tiered level of due diligence um, involved in every application. And this goes from the point of an agent having to do their own due diligence, um, to our local service providers who are regulated by our financial regulatory authority and they have to go through um, training and, and have um, regular audits. They are also required to have due diligence and KYC practices entailed. Once it gets to the unit, um, we go through a very rigorous uh, process of reviewing all of the documentation that is provided. We ensure that we get bank statements, we ensure that we can validate um, documents like uh, birth certificates, marriage certificates, that they're proper, properly apostilled or not, notarized. Um, once we go through that process, then we send it off to an international due diligence company that will do both um, due diligence from uh, open source, but also by placing boots on the ground, people who go uh, to the, the country of, of residence and validate uh, place, place of good, validate um, place of employment and, and um, ensure that all of the information provided in the application is recorded properly. Um, in addition, we do go out to international law enforcement, which uh, covers things like Interpol, um, both the public Interpol uh, lists and the private lists. Um, they will cover various databases from various international partners. And uh, through that process, we will be looking at results coming back from them that may identify um, any fraudulent activities, terrorist financing, linked to terrorist um, matters of, of that nature. Uh, another area that we will get a response on is basically the... Um, whether the individual has been denied a visa from certain countries. This um, flag of denying a visa is really an indication as to whether this person is also uh, someone who can be accepted in another country. So it's important that when we um, grant citizenship, we are granting citizenship knowing that this individual has also been accepted through our, uh, to or by our international partners. Um, our individuals are trained in anti-money laundering, but they're also trained in looking at financial uh, records, ensuring that we can flag or identify um, source of income, uh, proof of funds. If, if there's any flow of funds that are, are questionable, we will um, obviously uh, challenge that and ask for proper documentation to substantiate the individual's investment. So uh, thank you for that, Mr. Khan, uh, which brings me to my next question. Now, where are some of the top destinations uh, foreign investors come from? And are there some emerging markets that have become interested in St. Uh, Kitts and Nevis CBI program? Traditionally, um, most of our applicants um, would have come from um, the Middle East, from China, from Russia. Um, in the last couple of years, we, we saw a downturn in, on the Russian market because of some of the other programs um, that are dear Malta, Cyprus, et cetera. Um, but we're beginning to see uptick in, in, in the Russian applications again. So that, that is a market that's coming back to, to our side of, of the fence. Um, new markets are beginning to, to come up. We are seeing um, North Africa, we're seeing Nigeria, Kenya, 
as um, increasing in their interest. We, we have um, applicants, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam. India is, is a market that has not really been um, voluminous, uh, but we're seeing a lot more interest. And I, I believe over the next uh, couple of years, we will be uh, targeting our, our, our agents are targeting um, that area. So we will continue to um, monitor where the interest is coming from. And we have a marketing company uh, with CS Global. They, they help us with, with our um, distribution and in research in the various markets. We continue to see increased interest out of China, especially after COVID, out of the Middle East, again, especially after COVID. And, and many applicants around the world are now recognizing the need to have this uh, second option. They need to, to be able to travel. They need to be able to bring their families together. And this is one of the things that COVID identified, um, you know, to our applicants around the world is that, you know, they were stuck and, and weren't able to bring their families home or that they weren't able to, to go to the, their various families or to safer jurisdictions. Um, so we are seeing a lot of interest um, coming out as a result of this. Uh, now that Mr. Khan, you've mentioned CS Global Partners, I would have to bring in uh, Natasha over here. So, uh, Natasha, uh, we've taken uh, Mr. Khan's view on what has determined the success for the CBI program. Now, I would uh, like to ask you the same question on what, according to you, makes the St. Kitts and Nevis Citizenship by Investment Model so successful, since you are the partners and, as Mr. Khan mentioned, you distribute the program across the globe. So, what, would you, uh, what is your take on it? Well, thank you for the question. Um, and firstly, before I answer, I would just like to say um, how much of an honour it is to be sat talking with you and listening to our esteemed guests. So thank you for the opportunity and thank you as well to everyone in attendance. It My really pleasure. is greatly appreciated. Um, so to answer your question, I think there are a few points that I can mention here. Firstly, I want to talk about longevity. Um, as we have heard from Prime Minister Harris, the program has been in operation since 1984 and investors can see I think that this is a program that really has stood the test of time and I think this makes investors confident in their investment, confident that they're making a good investment by applying to the program. Um, as we have seen the program has gained global recognition for it being the platinum standard of the industry and I think that this is very attractive to potential applicants. Um, secondly, I would say that with respect to processing, um, yes, efficiency has been mentioned, but I want to talk about it again because it is so incredibly important and um, such efficient processing times are such an incredible asset to the St. Kitts and Nevis programme. The fact that an applicant who is successful and who passes due diligence can receive an approval in principle within three months of the submission of an application is an asset to the program. Um, and three months is a short time in itself, but um, offering the accelerated application process shows that um, St. Kitts and Nevis is innovative. It's the only program to offer such a guaranteed fast track option as Mr. Les Khan mentioned. Um, and so I think that it is this innovation and as well as its efficiency that really gives um, St. Kitts and Nevis an edge in the industry. And um, finally, I think I want to touch upon due diligence too, um, because as we have heard, um, it is the backbone of St. Kitts and Nevis programme. And um, I think that investors applying to the programme know that they are applying to a programme with integrity. And they know that at the end of the day, they are, if they are successful, of course, um, that they are getting a reputable citizenship and um, that they can be proud of. Thank you, Natasha, for that. Uh, I would like to go back to Mr. Khan. Uh, Mr. Khan, we have seen that people from the MENA region tend to add not only their spouses, but their entire family to a citizenship application. Now, what would be the requirements for such cases? Um, thank you for that question. It, it, it's interesting that um, there are a number of programs that um, have obviously a lower price for a single applicant, but we continue to get the, the family oriented um, applications. And this in, includes the main applicant, the spouse, the dependents, the dependents up to the age of 30, which is very unique 
uh, we allow that, um, that feature. We also allow the, um, the parents of the main applicant and the parents of the spouse. Once the parents of the spouse or main applicant obtains their citizenship, their parents, which means the grandparents, also qualify for citizenship. So it's an easy transition and a, and a, and a very low cost uh, when you, you take the whole package together. So um, the, the whole family entity is included in um, the application process uh, when they come in. And, and we see a lot of our, most of our applications are family oriented. So, uh, Mr. Khan, taking that, uh, you know, since the beginning, we've heard that how much of an importance do you give to due diligence? Now, how do you maintain, you mentioned upon it uh, in the first question and you discussed it, but could you elaborate on how do you maintain the balance between the ease of application and the stringent due diligence process? Uh, because we know that sometimes it could probably be a bit uncomfortable for people. So how do you maintain the balance between the two? Well, uh, first of all, I'll have to say that we do not compromise on due diligence at all. Um, it's, it's important that we go through our due diligence process. If our due diligence provider needs extra time to complete their due diligence, we allow that. But we track every file. We track every application as to where it is located. If it's with a due diligence company, we have commitments from due diligence companies in, in terms of contracts of how much turnaround time they need to give me a file. And if they start wavering on that, we cut them out. You know, we, we go to another due diligence provider because we have a, a multiple of, of D providers who are all qualified. Um, and we look for the best, we look for the fastest turnaround without, again, compromising the process. Um, but once it's within the unit, um, there are different stages within the process and we ensure true cross training through ensuring that our staff are flexible that can move from one point to another point that we can ensure that the flow of the application is, is seamless. So this balance, I have to say, I think we have it right and, and we're always monitoring this on a daily basis. We look at our numbers, we look at our statistics, we look at areas in our department that uh, we might think, uh, you know, there might be four, five files sitting somewhere. We want to make sure that moves and we adjust our staffing accordingly. And it's all done through cross training, through ensuring that we have the right people and ensuring that that file moves within the timeline that we, we have published. And, and I think we've, we've become very good at it and recognized. Um, one of the, the key features of, of the Citizenship by Investment Program in St. Kitts and Nevis is the relationships that we have. We have, over the years, uh, determined that it's best that we have relationships, both with age, well, all, with agents, with occasionally the clients, with the local service providers, with the developers. So we're open to questions. We, we can pick up the phone. They can pick up the phone. They can call us at any time and ask a question about a file. We try not to circumvent the process. However, if someone feels that a file is being delayed or it's, it's stuck somewhere, they can pick up the phone and call us, or call one of my team, and we will follow that file through and, and find out why that file is delayed. Sometimes it's, it's just um, communication between a local service provider and the agent. Um, but once we have this dialogue going, we can ensure that these small bottlenecks uh, are released very quickly. And again, it's because of, of the monitoring of our process. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, Natasha, the next question is for you. Now, uh, do you think that the post-pandemic period is a good time for individuals to consider the option of a second citizenship? Well, I, I would just like to say that um, at CS Global, we maintain that all times, um, any time is a great time to apply for a second citizenship. And that is because um, having a second citizenship has such value, no matter what is going on in the world. Um, but in terms of COVID-19, COVID-19 is one example of a crisis and one never knows when the next crisis may happen. So 
my advice to investors would be to be as prepared as possible um, for the unknown and have a plan B in place should the need, should the need arise. Um, and of course, second citizenship is one such example of a plan B. Um, I certainly wouldn't want investors to be deterred from applying to the St. Kitts and Nevis programme because of COVID-19. Um, the programme remains operational during the height of the pandemic. It still remains operational. Um, and this is due to, um, due in large part at least, to the programme's online case management system that we've heard about that allows ap applications to be reviewed remotely. Um, and this is something that should be reassuring to applicants. So, uh, Mr. Khan, coming back to you, since Natasha mentioned about the program is operational even remotely, even in these times. Now, uh, in your experience, Mr. Khan, what encourages applicants to consider investing in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, despite so many citizenship by investment programs globally, which you also mentioned uh, in the first question. So, what do you what do you think in your experiences uh, experience encourages them to still consider St. Kitts and Nevis? I believe uh, there are a number of factors. A uh, couple of factors were mentioned by the Prime Minister, um, basically being the longevity of our program, the stable political environment, the economic uh, um, growth in, in the country. Um, one factor we did not mention so far is the number of visa-free countries that we have access to. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis is uh, a leader in, in all of the CBI programs. We have about 156 countries um, with visa-free access or visa upon entry, and we will continue to, to grow in that arena. We're just behind in the Caribbean by one, one country, I think that's Barbados, and it's by one point, and I believe we'll overcome that very shortly. So our, our ability to um, give the client a very secure, robust um, variance in citizenship is, is one that brings us um, very much forward in, in our program. The other side of the equation is our investment options. We talked about the Sustainable Growth Fund. And the Sustainable Growth Fund, as we have just priced it at, at the um, limited time offer, is, is a very good option for a lot of our um, clients out there. And, and we're getting very, very good traction in terms of interest as, as we speak. The, Second part of our investment option is our real estate side of the equation. And St. Kitts and Nevis is known to be one of the only islands with at least five branded hotels um, as part of our portfolio. So this gives uh, the clients a certain level of certainty in terms of the quality of uh, development, in terms of um, the branding. You know, we talk about the Park Hyatt, we talk about uh, Koi, uh, Romada, Tea Loft, um, and the Four Seasons. And then we have some boutique hotels like Hamilton Beach and so on. These are all good, viable products. And we have a few more coming on stream that the government is ensuring that they will be solid, viable options to our clientele. So we'll continue to, to um, develop good portfolios. We will continue to ensure that uh, the client's investment is is a solid one that either he gets a rate of return or he gets you know through the real estate or the um the sustainable growth fund he gets the the right option that fits his needs and and we work with our agents we work with our developers we work with um our local service providers to ensure that this package is one that is is recognized and one that is shared uh, throughout the world uh, Mr. Khan, uh, you very well mentioned about the consistent development that the island has seen. Uh, and you also recently, uh, St. Kitts and Nevis recently announced a limited time offer for applicants under its Citizenship by Investment program. Now, could you let us know what is this offer and what do you expect the response to be after this, uh, once, since the offer is rolled out? Yes, uh, on the 1st of July, um, the, the Honorable Prime Minister announced uh, limited time offer to our sustainable growth fund. Um, the, the structure of the, the limited time offer is, is, is very simple. It's right now, our, our sustainable growth fund is 150,000 
for a single applicant and 195,000 for a family of four. With this limited time offer that will run uh, from now until the end of the year or about the 15th of January, um, we will be offering a 45,000 discount on, on that price. So for a family of four, we will be able to offer at $150,000. Now it should be recognized that any additional um, applicant to the file is just an additional 10,000. And our pricing structure has, hasn't changed in the addition of dependents. Um, but because of where we were and our pricing that we've had before, this additional 10,000 makes us most competitive in the marketplace. Um, even from what I'm seeing with the adjustments being made in other places. So we will continue to be competitive, but it comes down to the quality of the product, the quality of the country, the quality of citizenship that we're offering. And I believe that the interest is there. We are beginning to talk to a lot of agents. I am hearing they are uh, launching their own marketing programs and uh, the interest is beginning to, to generate. Uh I think in that case, my previous question to Natasha was wrong. That is this the right time to apply for second citizenship? I think with that lucrative offer, I think this is the best time for anyone to apply. Uh, uh, Natasha. Well, uh, that. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, Natasha, bringing you back into the conversation and uh, uh, at the beginning of this uh, interview and the panel discussion, uh, Mr. Khan mentioned in general about the countries uh, from where he's, uh, the country has seen uh, interest traditionally now, but could you let us know more about the response that you guys have seen as their trusted partners uh, for the St. Kitts and Nevis CBI program from the Middle East specifically? Yes, um, and while I can't speak for the government um, or give specific application numbers um, to CS Global Partners due to privacy reasons, yeah. what I can say is that the St. Kitts and Nevis Citizenship by Investment program has always been very popular with Middle Eastern applicants. Um, it continues to be one of our strongest markets and we expect it to continue to be strong, particularly with um, the new limited time offer. So, uh, Mr. Khan, uh, Natasha previously mentioned that uh, uh, the program is, I mean, the program is operational and it is being handled remotely. But do you think that the application process in these circumstances would need more time than usual? And what other considerations are there for a new applicant that you would like them to keep in mind when they're applying uh, to your CBI program? We, we have modified our process over the years and uh, you know, the efficiency factor continues to be one that, that we are very proud of. Um, during the, um, let's say this limited time offer, we expect we will see increased volumes and we have adjusted our staffing for that. We are ensuring that we are cross training. We are also working on an application, a front end application that um, is in testing right now that will be used by agents to get the application from themselves to a local service provider. So there isn't multiple levels of input. This will increase the, the timeline between a an agent and a local service provider. Many times or in the past, the local service provider will have to manually key in all of the details in that file and then upload all of the files. We will still require the upload feature, but the rekeying in of, in of information will reduce the amount of errors that we are seeing from local service providers against what the agent might have uh, submitted. And this will come straight into the unit. So we're working on this, uh, it's being tested. We have a couple of agents that are giving us feedback on, on, on that feature. And I would expect within a, a month or so, we should have it ready. So this would, would then alleviate this rekeying and, and also accelerate the ability for the file to come through very quickly. As I mentioned before, we've made adjustments to our staffing. We are looking at where the volume would come in, the timing of the volume. It's a little early to tell, um, but we, we can handle what is coming in. We expect we can handle uh, a higher volume just based on our experience. I remember we, we did have something that was called a hurricane relief fund. And that um, gave us a lot of experience in processing and adjustments and cross training and so on. So we, we feel very comfortable with our ability to handle any volume that comes in. During the COVID period, um, we didn't experience any delays in processing. Um, we spoke to our due diligence providers, and this is going to be a key in, in what we 
um, do as we go forward because due diligence providers sometimes get a bottleneck when they get volume. So we are talking to them, we're engaging with them already, advising them that they could be getting more volume. We're looking at multiple uh, due diligence providers. So we spread the, the, the work around, but we have to recognize that we will only use due diligence providers that are um, specialists in, in a certain region. Um, so we wanna make sure that again, our due diligence is not compromised, uh, but that we do get the effectiveness or the efficiency um, that we can through uh, a high volume period. Uh, Natasha, I would like to uh, ask the next question to you. Now, is there, do you think there is a strong preference uh, between the contribution to the fund or investing in real estate? Now, because you deal with a lot of applicants, I mean, your organization deal with, deals with a lot of applicants. How do you think they decide on this between the fund or, or uh, investing in real estate? Well, again, without giving specific numbers, um, I can say that the, especially in St. Kitts and Nevis, the fund option is extremely popular with applicants um, and we expect this popularity to continue. Um, in terms of the second part of your question, how applicants choose between um, the direct contribution or investing in real estate, there are a number of considerations to be made um, and it ultimately comes down to an individual's personal preference um, and attitude to investment. So with um, fund option, for example, one makes a direct contribution to the government and with investments in real estate, there is of course the ability to make a future return on investment. Um, however, to take the fund option as an example, um, applicants don't have the headache of having to purchase property in St. Kitts and Nevis, um, potentially hiring an attorney who specializes in real estate, visiting St. Kitts and Nevis to view the property. Um, and while, of course, I, I would not wish to discourage anybody from traveling to St. Kitts and Nevis because um, it's a wonderful place to visit, I will say that um, the fund option is certainly less bureaucratic um, and it's more hassle-free for investors who, as we know, are often time poor. So, uh... Uh, thank you for that, Natasha. Mr. Khan, uh, the last question is for you, and I think uh, uh, it's a question fit to be the last question uh, for this panel discussion. Now, in what ways do you think, or what ways would we see the CBI program change in the future? I believe that the, the St. Kitts and Nevis CBI uh, program will evolve. Uh, we are strengthening our program as it relates to the real estate option. We are tightening up various areas of our escrow bill. Um, that ensures that the client's um, funds are secure and that the clients get their return um, based on their investment. Through automation, we are continually looking at the uh, process improvements. We, I, I mentioned um, a front-end uh, feature that we're working on that uh, will make files come through much uh, faster, uh, more efficiently. Um, within the unit, obviously, we're trying to digitalize everything. Um, with the workflow system, we have most everything digitalized, but we're always looking to, to tweak it and, and make sure that we can reduce the timeline on processing without compromising the due diligence and the vetting process. Uh, it comes down to having um, people trained efficiently and properly with knowledge of anti-money laundering, um, uh, financial analysis and so on. So we're beefing up our areas in, in, in that um, capacity. As we, as we go forward, I would expect that um, volumes will come from different sources, as I mentioned, uh, new markets, and this will require much more due diligence again, uh, because it's new markets and we want to ensure that we are getting the right uh, character individuals. Um, this is where I see the program going for, for the medium to long term. And, and um, we will continue to ensure that St. Kitts and Nevis maintains its platinum brand, maintains its, its ability to draw um, applicants and um, to get their interest in, in the, one of the best programs or if not the best program in the world. I'm sure, I'm sure the, that would be the case going forward. With that, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Les Khan, thank you so much. Thank you, Natasha, for joining this panel. And of course, uh, thank you so much, Honorable Prime Minister. 
uh, uh, joining us early in the morning. I'm sorry if I've kept you gentlemen away from your breakfast uh, <laughs> till now. And thank you so much to all the delegates from the, across the Middle East who joined us today. Uh, the, the, our partners would be in touch with you to answer any queries that you have regarding this program and to help you uh, apply to this program in an efficient manner. With that, once again, thank you so much to our esteemed guests. Thank you so much to our attendees. And, uh, all the best for the CBI program and all the best to the applicants uh, who are going to be, who look forward to becoming uh, a part of this NKITS and Nevis family. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Natasha. Have a wonderful day and uh, stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us on. And we shall attempt to keep you updated and to keep the world updated about what is happening in St. Kitts and Nevis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Have a good day.